All right, everybody, David Parsons here. This is Nostalgia Trap. I'm ready to go if you are, even though Civil War is about to break out all across the country. Well, maybe. Go to our live stream. We're live every Thursday, 1 p.m., often with Justin Rogers Cooper lately as we're trying to unpack what the fuck is going on in America. But, you know, if you've been listening to Nostalgia Trap, we have been following this story for, since 2014, since since the very moment we started. This entire program has been about tracking apocalypse. Um, and if you need to know what we mean by apocalypse, we don't mean Michael Bay. We have a, a nuanced view, even a Marxist view of apocalypse on this show. Uh, so go back and check that out and come to our live streams at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Thursday on our YouTube channel. Really enjoying getting into that stuff. Uh, got a great conversation with Claudia Moreno Parsons here. This one's about dirty dancing. We wanted to take a break from all the bullshit and talk about dirty dancing this week. Um, this is a, a, a film that came out in the late 1980s, 1987, uh, with Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey. Uh, Claudia has a ton to tell us about what this movie's really about, uh, what it might mean, and why it's a, a deceptively simple film. It's a, 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 you know, it's a straightforward romance set in the 1960s that has a lot of commentary about class, about race, about gender. Really, really, it's it's almost like an indie film. There's there's nothing quite like Dirty Dancing. Um, and this was a good uh, follow up to our conversation about the Outsiders. Uh, if you want to go check that out on our Patreon, so these are the these are the kind of sort of movie conversations we're having on the Patreon. Wanted to give you a kind of idea of what these are like. So go over to patreoncom slash trap. We really appreciate your support, um, especially now that my career in academia is more and more threatened. Uh, than ever before because of COVID and all the uh, opportunities for neoliberal austerity coming out of that. Anyway, join our Patreon if you can. I really appreciate it. And please enjoy this conversation with me and Claudia Moreno Parsons on Dirty Dancing. All right, Claudia, last time we spoke, it was about The Outsiders, a film that came out in the 80s and was about the 60s, and today we're talking about Dirty Dancing, another film that came out in the 80s that was about the 60s, and is seems like a very a huge nostalgia trap film for a number of reasons on a number of levels, but um, it seems like especially a nostalgia trap film for you personally. Oh, I, yeah. I've known you've liked this film forever. I guess what I want to know first is, did you see it in the theater, or did you have like a VHS copy, or what started you watching this movie? Oh, I would have been... I don't, yeah, no, I have no idea. I definitely, <laughs> I, de I don't think I saw it in the movies because it would have come out, it came out in 87, right? So which would have made me 12. And I don't think that we saw that in the movies. I rented it on videotape 40,000 million times. Um, and like isn't the right word. <laughs> I, I, uh, I love, I lust. This, this is probably um, the best, greatest, most favorite movie of all time yeah. in my life. Yeah, yeah it's weird. Um, and it's it was influential to me in, in a weird way, because I didn't see this movie until I think you and I, I think you showed me this movie. Right? I did. Just like yes. The Outsiders. So this is another <laughs> one that, this is another one that you've, uh, you've brought into my own, my own library. But I'm glad because for me, I mean, I, obviously it gives me a deeper picture of who you are <laughs> and your own biography, etc. <laughs> but it, they're also films that fit very well with the stuff we think about on the show, which is like the connections between the 80s and 90s and the like 50s and 60s, you know, right. the sort of like cross-generational thing that right. you and I feel a part of and connected to. And it's like really weird to feel like we know the 50s and 60s. And not only that, mm -hmm. uh, because we weren't alive during those times. Right. Not only that, but you and I have talked about before, like we know kind of like 1930s and, and 40s sure. culture from our grandparents, especially you with yep. your grandparents. Mm -hmm. right. um, There's a connection to generations past that um, I don't know how far into the future it continues. I don't know how, you know, like how present the things like the 30s or the 50s or the 60s are to you. I think it depends on your family. Yeah. You know, what, what you've been shown and what you are not been shown, have not been shown and, you know, how that plays out. Yeah. Um, I, it's funny because I'm thinking about Forrest Gump now being a film in the 90s that like brought the 60s to yeah. me. Yeah. And it's like so, so different than films like The Outsiders and Dirty Dancing, which are movies that, you know, it, for, for those that haven't seen them, they're really, they're, they're, they're very... They're unique in, in terms of Hollywood productions. Mm -hmm. Both Dirty Dan... I mean, we talked about The Outsiders as like this film that, that sort of stands out tonally yes. from other... Even other Coppola films. 
Um, but Dirty Dancing is, for those that haven't seen it, it came out in 1987. It's it's a film that really the protagonist is Jennifer Grey. Yep. Or played by Jennifer Grey. Uh, a character called Baby, who's what's supposed to be like basically just graduated from high school. Yeah, she's literally, it's the summer after she graduates high school. She's supposed to be going to Mount Holyoke in the fall. And Mount Holyoke is either, uh, sorry, Jersey or Long Island. Yeah. It's, it's, on this East I think Coast. It's I think it's Jersey. Yeah. Um, But there, yeah, it's like an East Coast cat. It's a cat skill story. Yeah, right? it's, a, it's, come, it's a long standing tradition of families, particularly Jewish families, um, particularly liberal <laughs> Jewish progressive. <laughs> Of Jews on the East Coast going to the Catskills um, for summer vacations, right? And so the the premise is that she and her family, but she says it's the year we went. It, they're not supposed to have gone every single year because the dad never takes a vacation because he works so hard. He's this hardworking doctor, right? And so they're going to spend a few weeks at this basically what looks to me like a camp, you know, like summer camp for grownups. <laughs> but it's run by this guy Max Kellerman. Yes, um, the Kellermans. Yes, like and and at the beginning, like when they when this family arrives and they're yeah they're this like middle class family um and when they arrive uh in their station wagon mm -hmm. and this is supposed to be it's like the summer of 1963 she yes. says it's right it's before kennedy was killed yep but she the the voiceover at the beginning sort of establishes it like you know this is before we lost our innocence of the 60s almost like it's sort of like this is before it all went bad in some ways well, like i don't a, know if it's, it's before it all went bad but before yeah the, the before things get darker i guess yeah. and also for her and for the world around her right she's at this point she opens up and, and i when i was watching it again the other night um i had forgotten how earnestly liberal they are yes. like they're all oh, the whole family the doctor explicitly, doc, explicitly so. like they they care about poor people in hungry children yes. and economics she's supposed to be she's reading a book in the car for opening scene called the something like the plight of the peasants mm. and she says that she's going to major in uh the economics of underdeveloped countries when the boss's right. grandson says oh, are you majoring the, in english and she says no and she's going to join the peace <laughs> Core, core. Right. yeah they're 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 idealistic kennedy people i mean maybe mm -hmm. that's why the jfk mm -hmm. thing is mentioned because yeah. like it's before kennedy was killed we were like very much into the whole project it's funny because it's even even when they don't know the exact details of like the geopolitics they still nod to it like someone says like oh, where are the hungry children oh it's southeast asia right, now right like that's where we're supposed to be concerned is it still africa no no now it's southeast asia she even right. mentions the burning monks which yes, is she does. you know that that's in i mean that's in 63 that mm -hmm. all that stuff is happening right. so it's really i mean it is key into like a very specific historical moment and a very specific um, cultural thing. You're talking about like the Jews and the Catskills. Yes. We were just reading how that, you know, literally the transportation network, like the train line mm -hmm. stopped in the in 1953 and that whole phenomenon like started to slow down. Right. And you see that in the film, like at the end the of the film and we're jumping ahead, but like at the end of the film there, the Max Kellerman comes out and sings that song and, and he he's kind of saying like, we're, we're dinosaurs here. Yeah, he's yeah. talking to the old band leader, right? That's Tito, right. Tito Suarez. He's talking, and and yeah. the, I just want to point out that the band leader is a sort of um, Latino American, but like black Latino American. His name is Tito Suarez, and it's like the whole. Um, this milieu of the fucking not camp it's not a camp of the resort <laughs> yes. is like liberal itself this right. idea of a segregated as much as it can be i mean he's the band yes. <laughs> right uh -huh. but that he's been there with with max kellerman from the very very beginning and they're re reminiscing right before kellerman goes on stage and he says you know things are changing and the kids don't want to come here and do the foxtrot and all of this and and the two of them are these kind of like they're together generationally even though they're very, right. very different of who they are of and who they what does he be. say the kids Kids want to do now the rock and roll oh, no. or and they the want to go, they want to backpack europe Europe. that's right that's says right something like 22 countries in three days yeah. and he shakes his head <laughs> like he's disgusted by the yeah. very idea of yeah. like going and touring around europe um yeah there's the the the, the movie is um it's funny you mention segregation mm -hmm. because the movie is kind of could have been called the outsiders in some way right <laughs> yeah yes because yes, totally. ultimately like what the plot of the movie is is you discover, you know, and, and you discover a lot, literally you, you discover this, I love this moment. It's a very blue velvet moment. But like Jennifer Grey, baby, she like 
sneaks off or, or goes off, you know, to explore the camp yeah. when she, when they first get there. And she sees like what she's supposed not supposed to see. Right. She Says has guests this only, scene. Uh, no guest staff only, please. Right. And there and there, but there's like she's peeking through the. She, it's a voyeuristic moment. She's yeah. like pe- peeking through, and I love it because it's like she's hearing this like back channel conversation <laughs> between um, the the boss Max oh, right. Kellerman yep. mm-hmm. and all the waiters and the the, the 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 basically the men who are going to be there. And it's all about daughters. Like he's like, what are they saying? Like you're the college boys, and you're here to um, treat them nice and show them the dances and take them out by the lake. And right. and he says, and it's so grotesque. He says even the dogs, and he means the quote unquote ugly daughters. Right. Right. Like you have to take them all out. That's your job. That's what you're here for. Um, and as we see later, you'll get paid out basically by the dads for doing so. Like you know, the baby's father later is wants to give one of them some money. He takes it back, but That's you know, right. it's, just, it's, almost, yeah. it's almost like they're sex workers. Oh yeah, yeah, right. And and then it's different from the like when the dancers and the ent- quote unquote entertainment staff and everybody's very like dripping with disdain about them. That oh, that's the those are the dancers. You right. Know? So let's set that up because it's like li- yeah, literally. So this scene, is, this scene is 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 really really integral to what they're setting up in terms of like Jennifer Grey's character's sort of awareness and and coming of age. It's a coming yes. of age story. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And coming of age and a coming of understanding of the world of men and like yeah. very different types of men. So he sees those uh, the the waiters are the are the college boys. These are the guys that you're that the rich parents are okay with their daughters dating right because they're college boys and these guys are going to show those daughters a good time right etc but it's all but supposed then, to be very safe right but then uh patrick swayze who we will get to you know <laughs> the 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 incredible we can't say enough about patrick swayze it's, <laughs> it's actually hard to watch him sometimes yeah knowing um the tragedy of his life uh at the same time he's just like this glowing insane um, star, you yeah. know, that's all he is. I, I mean, he's just an, an incredible star, but he's in this scene and she sees him too. And right. he's kind of like the uh, clearly like a leader within this uh, group of entertainers, the right. dancers, the dance people. He, with, with he and says. they're like the riffraff, yeah. right? They're portrayed well, as lower this, class. Right. So we started, you know, we said segregation before, but we also, you, the, this, the movie has so, got so many layers to it because now it's class. And it's very much about the college boys who ha- are going to Harvard and Yale. And he says, I go to Harvard and Yale to get you for a reason. You, this is your job. And the dance people um, are from wherever. They're, they're from the cities. They're from, they're not in college. They're, they're, they're the poor kids and it's really important because you know you said the voyeuristic moment about this scene Mm -hmm. where Max Kellerman is explaining to the waiters what their role is I had actually jumped ahead to when she finds the dance people in their space yeah because that's also a very um, voyeuristic kind of lynch moment where the doors open onto and we see what those um, young brown black kids look like what they're doing and how come they are forbidden and you know what's incredible about that scene is the the scene where she finally sees the quote unquote dirty dancing, right? <laughs> it's rock like, and roll. It's 1963. Yeah. This is the coming of rock and roll. It's right. all and it's, it's like and it's meant to be like this is race mixing yes. and sex. You yes. know, like this is what's going on and the music too. I oh. mean, I mean, this, it, it, that was what I wanted to say early on. Is like my entry to this movie was through the soundtrack. Yeah, my parents had. The two tapes, because there was they actually put out two soundtracks. There yeah. were so many songs yeah. in this movie. Um, and listening to those songs that really, when you think about it, the songs tell the story of the movie again yeah. and again. Like, do you love me now that I can dance? You know, <laughs> I can mash potato. And I remember that one and thinking, oh, well, I, almost like I knew the plot of the movie before I saw it. Um, but that scene where she finally sees, you know, this group. What I was going to say is that that could have been a really stupid scene. Oh, totally. With a whole lot of... Um, and a, one of the reasons I think it's not stupid is because you don't hear a lot of dialogue. You don't go around meeting every oh, no. single type of person. Hey, I'm the black kid. And, <laughs> hey, I'm the Latino kid. No. Instead, you just see it literally is the language of the dancing. And I can't help but thinking that that, that the writer of this film and the direct, directors of this film, they very carefully wanted to portray that it was the dancing itself that's communicating all that stuff. Absolutely. And it's really interesting because it's all about bodies. You know, I, I kept thinking that the whole thing, the whole time, this is about bodies mm-hmm. and about the 
pure pleasure of those bodies and the mixing of those bodies and in stark contrast that these kids because there are and I was paying attention the last time I watched it there are couples that are uh, black couples there are couples that are Latino couples there are white couples but then there are mixed couples there are like and in 1963 Right in a space like this, it's a, it's supposed to, it would be a very shocking moment had the rest of the like the Kellermans and all the families that are there, they'd be like oh, kind of, you know, mm-hmm. shocked at what they'd seen, which is why they're not so, there. It says, you know, uh, no guests, please staff only. And they're like, they're really segregated into a separate space. They have their own living quarters. They have their own lives. And what's happening there with rock and roll and sex and bodies is the 100% opposite of the kind of. Um, sanitized, liberal, safe space that the Jewish families are having, the middle class and rich Jewish class families are having mm-hmm. in the like the rest of the resort. Yeah. Um, which is its own weird thing because you, the question of like coming from New York, thinking about um, Jewishness as whiteness or not whiteness mm. is its own complicated right. thing. Yeah. Because what you really, if you say the outsiders, I mean, this, these, the, these resorts in the Catskills, they were primarily Jewish and it was this kind of outside thing at a moment when I think a lot of Jews are being perceived as mm, white. Mm-hmm, yeah. At, right? So it's a and, but, balance that right, they're striking. Right. That right. they're trying to achieve for themselves and, the, and and it gets tangled up as it always does with class. Mm. And there's, I mean, I feel like there's even androgynous couples in this, in these scenes yeah. where you're like, wow, girls, is that, like, is this a queer couple that they're showing? Girls like it feels- with very, sh- very short hair uh-huh. and, and guys with long hair and everybody's got like clothes that are offbeat and show their bodies and a lot of their clothes are sort of um, not falling off but they're very revealing um, in a very I don't know but it's there's something incredibly like truly sexy about this. Yeah, there's it's a not, lot. Of, there's a lot of uh, skin in yes, this movie. Yes, There's yes. a lot of like uh, clothes falling off and 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 that sort of thing. And at some point, I mean, during these uh, what what maybe the most famous sequences in the film are the ones that I saw. You know, even without seeing the film, you saw clips of it on TV where, like, the um, montages be- between Swayze and Jennifer Grey where they're training and they're right. dancing. And and in a lot of those scenes, like, they're wearing next to nothing oh, yeah. as they're dancing, including yeah. lots of scenes where I'm like, okay, Swayze's just got his shirt off here. And, <laughs> well, like, yeah. his shirt is completely off. And we're just we're just dancing we together because are... we're sweating and listening to this music. And, I mean, ultimately, it's a love story. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's one that... Uh, in terms of like the people of that 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 are being shown, in, you know, that, that are the dancers in that crowd, you have the con the contrast with these, uh, because it's you know this the 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 surface story is well these are the libidinal people these are the people having sex but you know the the the, the college boys are having sex too oh yeah and what we discover is how like fucking rotten the yeah. politics of all that is yes through this character Robbie who I posted the uh, on on Twitter last night the the the, the frame of him. Um, you know, because he gets a girl pregnant. Yes. Uh, and this is kind of the core of the film. Right. But he get the, a college boy gets um, a dancer. Yes. Pregnant. Mm-hmm. An entertainer. So he's gone slumming, in other <laughs> he words. Basically, yes. yeah. That's the right. word they use. Um, and his attitude towards it is like, look, this girl, this girl banged every guy here. Why should I be responsible for this? Leave me alone. It's none of my... And, and then he even says to her, this is Jennifer Grey, like investigating this. Right. He says to her, um, look, some people count and some people don't. And he takes out Ayn Rand, the, uh, the fountainhead, and he says, read this book. It's all in here, you know? And he even says, like, but give it back to me because I've got some notes in the margin, which is like an unbelievably hilarious depiction of, like, the libertarian, yeah. conservative attitude of, like, a rich fucking douchebag who's like, look, some people count, some people don't. He's such an asshole. But it's really deep satire yeah. of that kind of shit. Yes. I mean, you fucking hate this guy. Yeah, totally. And I think about it now, watching it at 12, 13, 14, 15, I, I, don't, I don't think I really, because under- I had no idea what the fuck the fountainhead was or who mm-hmm. Ayn Rand was right. but I knew that he was an asshole and I hated him there was nobody more loathsome in the film except for the the the, the little skeevy the, the grandson I right. forgot the kid's name oh, he's the one who's after yeah. baby Ben Ben, ben Kellerman right? yeah Ben Kellerman and he is he's worse there are, yeah that, so that's what I love about the movie is like the, it's, <laughs> it's like and someone pointed this out uh, on Twitter they're like god this movie hates fucking rich people yeah. and like yeah they're loathsome assholes in this movie and Ben Kellerman who you know Jennifer Grey's character baby is is meant to like go out with him yeah. she's, she's like basically set up with him right and he has this monologue where he takes her out and he says like you know I'm a huge catch 
uh, and and I take girls away from other guys, oh. and I t- and actually I took a girl away from a guy last week, and and the guy said, "What is what is a he have that I don't?" He said, two hotels." <laughs> and like the guy's fucking like it's like literally it might as well be a Trump son. <laughs> yeah, like it literally might as well be a, a Eric Trump or something, being like, "I've got two hotels, and that's why I get girls." And he's this little squirrel of a guy. It's so shitty. But you know what you're saying oh, God, about the um, you yeah, totally about like the. Uh, um, loathsomeness of these people because right, later on at some point Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey they're talking and he, they're trying to understand each other and he's like no you don't understand he says these these people he's like they are rich and they are mean yeah, right that's yeah. literally what he says and you understand that he's made the kind of choices or sacrifices because he needs the fucking job he's like I if I fuck this up I lose this summer's pay and next summer's gig and I can't afford it so I have to put up with this i have to like because he's this beautiful mm. you know amazing dancer all the women love him right because the ben kellerman is like i don't know women seem to like him and he's like it's like he doesn't <laughs> understand why right and it's swayze so we understand why right. but it's like the sense that he's being he's like no i'm the one being used here um and That's it kind an of awful when he says that when he yeah. says they are rich and they are mean there's yeah. it, it's like it, it's like these are vipers and the way that the um God, the, is it Penny? Is that her name? The the, the woman who the is dan- the, the, the dancer that has the pregnant? abortion. Yes. Yeah. She. I mean, they're all like terrified of these people. Yes. They're like terrified of the rich people who control their jobs. Don't let them find out. Yeah. Find us or find out what we're doing or think about us in any way. It's it's it totally that. I mean, that's what reminds me of the outsiders. Yeah. Is the sort of like the feeling like the, we cannot cross these lines. Yeah. Um. And so yeah, what happens is, and and this is I think what's Part of the reason this film is 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 praised, I think, in later um, in later eras, is because there's a, there's a depiction of abortion in this yeah. film that, like, I you know, having never seen the film before and all these years gone by, I thought the film was literally just a love story about dancing, and I didn't realize that it's really it's it's one of those films that almost you know falls into the 1970s category, yeah. uh, like uh, you know Saturday Night Fever, right? Where you're like a film that's about dancing, but it's like this is actually about the poverty and about class, yes, and about, and about the the way that, that that these things are um that these things affect the body. Maybe that's why they're dancing films, yeah. because yeah. it's like abortion falls into this, and abortion fall the story. Uh, of what happens is something that is surprising in terms of the way, yeah. how much the attention they put on this. Um, and I think it's been praised for its depiction. Yeah, right. So the whole the whole reason that Jennifer Grey is learning the dance routine is because Penny has gotten, quote unquote, knocked up by Robbie, Mr. Fountainhead, right? Who doesn't want to take care of it. And he says it costs two, $250, right? Yep. To $250 to get the abortion. Um, this is like 1963. So this is the pill is like just making its appearance in 1963. This is pre Roe versus Wade. This is a disaster. And it's like they can't work. They can't. They're trying to get the money together to get to get the abortion. But then they finally get the money. Baby gets the money for them. From but her father. From her from father. Her father. And she doesn't yeah. tell him why. Right. So she goes and, and it's but the one day they can get the appointment is on her show date. And that's why that's then that's the whole dance sequence stuff. But they keep coming back to the abortion. And I just want to point out that they come back to the disaster that is the abortion after she's in agony. She's basically, <laughs> excuse me, gone some like backroom bullshit. Yeah. And as a kid, I was like, what the fuck is this? Right. I just knew that like this is like danger and that women face this thing. But they deal with the aftermath of all of that, right, before Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze finally get together. It's mm. like, this mm-hmm. is more important. We're yeah. going to get there. Yeah. Right? Because they, they do, the two of them do their dance at the hotel. It's this kind of most of success. You see him start to fall in love with her. Right. You, at, at that moment when she's changing in the back seat and he's looking at her in the rear view That's mirror. That's right. Yeah. And you see him change. They get back and you think, oh, okay, well, they're going to go back to his cabin now. And they do. But the cousin comes running up and says, you've got to take care of Penny. She's not okay. Well, yeah. And the storytelling. And they spend uh, a long time with that before they come back. Because it sets up um it, it sets up the, the sort of moral core of the characters you know and mm-hmm. you 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 see yeah. like what uh, a, a piece of shit robbie is yep but you also see that robbie is not going to 
necessarily, you know, be seen as a piece of shit by people because right. he's he's, you know, within the category of of human beings that get to get away with stuff like this. And we also then see how what a good person baby's father is even yeah. though he's totally moral, morally opposed to this he basically very quietly flips out on baby afterward and is like you're never to see these people again he's he's up talking to her for a while but as like um a humane doctor yeah he takes care of her and his but his, his assumption is that patrick swayze is the father of this baby and that patrick swayze is the one that is sort of like gotten her in trouble and basically. he says he says who's responsible and and the character johnny he says i am right and he, he takes won't shake that his responsibility like, no he refuses um so th i mean this is a another part of the movie that i feel like is handled really really um really subtly and could have been done in a really um I think like cartoonish way. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Ebert, uh, Roger Ebert hated this movie. I don't know if he changed his mind. Roger Ebert is wrong about a lot of stuff. I know I talk about Roger, Roger Ebert a lot in part because I was like really into him when I was young. Um, but as I got older, like so many, he missed so much. There are so many like famous reviews of his. Like Blue Velvet is probably one of the most famous that he like hated that he got movie. It totally wrong. Uh, and then years later, was like, oh shit, I missed it. Um, <laughs> and he hated it for dumb reasons too. Um, but either way, uh, <laughs> he didn't like Dirty Dancing. And I think one of the things he he hated about it, he's like, oh, this is just like a really simple story. But it's I think not. What, what I think what he missed um, is is how how well these like sort of tropes that we've seen a million times are done. And the specific one I'm thinking about now is the trope of the daughter and father and it's sort of like the uh the teenage daughter and the father who's you know sort of um overly concerned and protective about mm -hmm. his daughter mm -hmm. and that that we've seen that a million times of in course, a million movies yeah. but i feel like jennifer gray and jerry orbach both the way they play it per, like in their performances and the sort of understated script because we were saying earlier yeah like jerry orbach mr law and order <laughs> uh, you know who shows up in a lot of movies. Actually. Yeah, he shows he's up great. all over. <laughs> he's perfect for this role, but like he doesn't. He's not like a total asshole no, dad at no, all. No, not at all. Like the, we're gonna see these tensions play out, but he's not like a. Uh, he's not like this, he's not like an overtly like. Uh, like a piece of shit. No, at all. not at all. He's not one. You understand his position, and he's not one dimensional at all. He's obviously like struggling and trying to understand things that are getting away from him. Mm. This is very much a movie about shifting generations, right? Yeah. Where Max Kellerman is even older. He's like the old, the, the, the grandpa generation. And then you've got the Orbach, the, the baby's parents, and then you have baby. And you see that kind of Jerry Orbach's character is in between where he's got the one thing, but he understands enough and wants to understand and wants to understand his daughters. Um, and, and, and he's making that effort and he doesn't turn Penny down. I, this, you got remember i saw this the first time probably maybe 13 at the latest if it was in the movies in 12 i probably saw it at 13 wow. right yeah. because it was by the, the delay with the vhs tape right <laughs> renting it or whatever right um that i th that his like I understood his nuance and I understood his complexity, right? Yeah. I, like I, or I, like I responded to that. Whereas like the Robbie character and the Ben character, they're like fun to hate because they're just pure loathsome. But the, the, her father's character is more complicated because you're not, you can't just hate him because he's not just a bad guy. He's got depth to him. That's the thing that the, with this movie is that they all have, um, as, as in some ways as silly as it is and as romantic and funny as it is it also like it really is getting into things a including the jennifer gray including baby right yep. and how she perceives her own body her first experience with sex how much she likes it how much control she has over it as a 13 14 15 year old girl this set the like my fucking mindset of like oh this is what this is supposed to be and anything less than this <laughs> is no good <laughs> right <laughs> i mean i I'm, and you're talking about like romance yes too. It's yes not, you know yes. like the and and not only that but sort of like it, it's so much of the movie is her the, it's weird to say this but like they're drawn to each other's character yes like, yes it, it, as much as the film is this like on the surface you'd be like oh it's about these two really hot young actors patrick swayze and jennifer gray who had worked together in red dawn before and had like famously had like a sort of like didn't uh, like each other yeah but like so <laughs> almost like a playful annoyance with each other that mm -hmm. sometimes turned into actual annoyance on swayze's part especially a uh, sort of um impatience with her youth yeah which is sort of what 
the the character play like how their tension plays out. Right. So in other words, like the the film is is, is very easily could have just been a sort of soft core porno, um, <laughs> and it does it actually does function in, yes, in, in, in as in a soft core porno. Yeah. We got tons of like long lingering shots up and down of their bodies while they're dancing, close up um, of hands caressing chest and everything like that. Yet the movie is so much of their love. Is, is is like established as like through this abortion story, mm-hmm. through this class thing, as like they're good people and they respect each other for yes. doing the right thing, which is yes. incredible. And that like he he want they want to like do the right thing in each other or for each other. They see the right thing in one another, mm-hmm. and they um they that they there's a there's a power like balance almost like in one in the one sense in terms of the dancing he has it all over her but she can move everybody says that right no she can do this because we, she can dance so we just have to give her time and she stands <laughs> up for herself over and over yeah. again and it's like it's not just like oh teach me master and not at all and and for me as a as a t- young teenage girl that was really really important because i saw him fall in love with her when she made mistakes when she fucked up um, when she was very brave, when she was very like, she was just always herself. She never fucking changed herself. Like she grew and she learned, but she never like um, became that fucking girl thing where you like, you you yeah, change yourself right. for the, yeah. you know, whoever. And also just to go back for a quick second, when you're talking about, you know, cameras lingering on bodies, the camera lingers on his body just as much. Oh yeah. If not more than hers. Yeah. And, and that was important to me too, because I think that was the like, one of the earliest times that I ever saw that like, oh, this is, um, I mean, it's gays and it's fetish and it's like this pure, yeah, it's softcore porn thing in mm-hmm. there. But it's also like, it's from her perspective. Yeah. And and that first time they make love, right? Or they have sex. She's like walking around him and looking at him and she touches his ass and she <laughs> touches his back. And mm-hmm. she's like in as much control of this as he is in a sense. And, and seeing it as a young teenager, um, it, I, I think it really, really like it, fucking stuck yeah i mean yeah. her uh, her i'll use a grad school word her agency <laughs> yes uh is demonstrated and, and it's uh, throughout the film in a lot of different ways mm-hmm. and it's kind of about her like gaining that and understanding it but it's also like uh, th- thinking about the way just these scenes of uh, over and over of them learning of yeah. her learning learn there, it, there's like a, a, a another grad school um thought a discourse of pedagogy <laughs> is is definitely here if justin if justin rogers cooper were here <laughs> he would have a lot to say about the erotics of pedagogy yeah yeah uh, and the sort of way that that um having human bodies lo- learn in spaces is something that it has a very particular charge to it um, and is is maybe a part of learning in a way that we don't necessarily want to acknowledge because it's a really uncomfortable part of yeah learning. no I think but you've... like at the same time like this w- w- what's portrayed in this in this movie uh, in the dance sequences is is that it's yeah. sort of like uh, how do we because you mentioned like oh it's she's not like yes master no it's, it's, there's not an S and M thing going on here no there's some sort of like synthesis there's some sort of like equal footing of learning which is interesting because he is the master here yeah absolutely but he's also he is like the mark right of this good teacher right the Mm -hmm. pedagogy he's learning from her yeah he's learning her body he's learning how to teach her he talks about being taught to teach right that's right it's the scene in the, yeah. in the log scene where they're like they're dancing and they're trying to learn the balance it's a very star wars montage where they go off into the woods and, <laughs> and they, do, they do balancing tricks and and stuff like that and, and they're all, yeah he's on a log that's a great scene and he says yeah i actually because she says how'd you get started dancing and he's yeah. like well you know i went to school at arthur murray you yeah, know it's a very studio, famous dance studio and that and that, that they taught me how to teach. Yes. Yeah. He, like it's very meta in that way. He, they're talking about, and she always wants to know, this is a constant question for her. Um, how, how did you learn that? Where did you learn that? Why do you know that? She asks that several times yep. throughout. Where did they learn that? Right. Where did they learn how to do that? And that's, so it's part of what she asks him. And so there's this conversation that acknowledges what's happening 
right? And that they are like, as they, the more they work together, the more he understands her and how to teach her and how to respond and learn from her body and her cues and who she is. And they ultimately like their dancing chemistry is fucking off the charts. Like it just is. And everybody who in the making of the movie too, they did because the two of them, you know, we were saying they didn't really like each other. They were sort of annoyed with each other. Yes. But they did a test, like a screen test, mm -hmm. and everyone was like, "Holy shit!" Like the it like sparks just flew. And I read something that they were like they periodically had to show the two of them that again because they would start to get annoyed with each other, and they made them sit and watch the that screen test again because it was so clear. Like, look, remember, look, remember <laughs> the magic that right. made us cast you right. in the first place. And and it really comes across like you really like there something about the way they've ultimately learned each other's bodies and who they yeah. are. Mm -hmm. You. Um, you really respond to it. It's sort of impossible not to. Yeah, and yeah. um, it 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 brings me back again to this this sort of exchange of money that's happening here, and that this sort of like there is a um, there's an element of prostitution to what to what Patrick Swayze's character portrays. You know, and he in he, terms of his getting together with the rich women. Yes. yes. Well, th yes, but even that, like, with so. He, She's expl she asks, like, have you had a lot of women at right. some point after they have sex? And and Patrick Swayze says, look, you don't know what it's like. Like, all these rich women, they, they're so clean. They smell so good. They're all clawing at me. And, and she says, oh, so you use them. And he says, no, you don't get it. They use me. Right. So it's like there's this, like, fantasy exchange happening, yep. you know, and mm -hmm. it's crossing class lines. But there's also – what I was thinking about with prostitution was there's a scene towards the end of the movie where – Johnny Patrick Swayze's character is just kind of like in the in the dining room, and this rich douchebag oh, yeah. he leads over and the says, "Hey, rooms. listen, yeah, hey, listen, uh, my wife is, you know, it turns out I'm going to be in town for a little bit longer. Uh, my wife's going to be bored, and he throws a hundred dollars at him, which is a ton of money at yep, the time, yep. and says like, why don't you give her a few dance lessons? And he's such a fucking asshole yep. about it, you know. And Johnny looks down at the money, and it's like, you know, what his these are decisions that working people and poor people make. Yep. He looks down at the money and he's like, look, I don't think I'm going to have time. It wouldn't be and right honestly, to take the yeah, money. It wouldn't be right to take your money. And he gives it back. And the guy's like, whatever. But like the like cheap way that that they tr they they treat these people yes the cheap they way that they them. just they just like literally throw money at them and say why don't you teach me how to dance yeah like in other words like you see the joy that he gets in dancing yes you see that like when you the whole point of this movie in some ways is that these people exist they really love this that, like this is like their lives yes they are all about like really dancing they really care Patrick Swayze talks about it several, Johnny says several times like what he's teaching the kids and this kind of stuff they want to do and the thing with with baby and Johnny right is that there's no there is no exchange it's actually all it costs him being with her cost him his job yeah. and cost her uh, briefly her relationship with her father and her relations with her family. There's like, it's, it's, but they do it anyway. And it's in, in stark contrast to the exchanges that literally happen everywhere else. But you're right. This thing of like money and survival is um, everywhere. And that there is this thing of the dance as the art, as passion, as something that it's because toward the end, he says, you know, my father called and he could get me into the union, you know, the house painters union. He's like ashamed to say and that. And he's like, yeah, he's ashamed. And, and it's funny to me listening to it now when I was watching it the other night again. Um, because I was like, well, that's a good fucking job. Like, that's what I said. That's a good job. I was like, take that fucking take job, that fucking dude. Job. That's like 50 bucks an hour. <laughs> that's a serious um, job. Yeah. But he's like, for him, it mean, and I get it because I come from people like this, right? <laughs> My fa a family of like gonna reject um, that kind of quote unquote basic thing. That to me now, in my eyes, I'm like Jesus. That's a good job. His he's got this other sort of passion and art. And it's like yeah, it's really a good job, but I don't want to lay bricks. I don't, yeah, right. I don't want to. Right, exactly. Like I have this thing that I love and I want to do it. And how do I do it, dude? Isn't that? I mean. Another uh, another Justin Rogers Cooper movie. Um, hello, Justin, if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> Goodwill Hunting. You oh, know? right, right. And I think at some point, um, uh, in in the really great exchanges between, uh, and that's another outsider insider movie, right? Yes, about yes. academia, about everything. But at some point, Matt Damon is talking to you know Robin Williams in a therapy session, and he says, uh, you know, I, I'm like Robin Williams is like, why don't you apply yourself more? You know, like why. And he says, look, you know, my uncle laid bricks. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he basically tells that story. Romantic, and he says, my uncle laid bricks and I, I'm going to lay bricks. And that's it. You right. Know? And Robin Williams tells him, 
Like no, you know, you know that's not good enough for you. And Rob, Matt Damon's like, you know, why the fuck not? Right. But, but it's like it's complicated because it is a fucking good job uh-huh. and it's an important thing to do. And there, and there is this thing of like, no, well, this is a really serious kind of work, um, and it's work of the body and it's work of like uh, the the reality of society and, mm-hmm. and and structure and everything else. But it's like there's there's a. Um, or at least there was. I don't know if it's changed, but there was a stigma about that. Like, yeah. oh, he's just, he's a union guy, electric or plumbing or, you know, and this is the kind of like, I grew up in a neighborhood that was full of, of men like this who did yeah. this sort of stuff. And we always kind of felt like on the outside of it. And because mm. my, that's not what my family did. Yeah. Right. And well, so, I mean, the, t- the tensions between like becoming a laborer and being an artist. Yes. I mean, we've talked about that a lot. I mean, like William Carlos Williams. Yep. You know, a guy who like is a, this PD Pediatrician, practicing physician. Yes, the entire time he's like this major writer and poet. Yes. <laughs> this this dude is literally between kids coming in to visit him for and delivering visit, babies. <laughs> he, he is he is literally has a drawer where he's pulling out a typewriter and typing out poetry. Yeah. and these are like epic poems that, that are some of the like finest modernist poetry. Most of the 20th extraordinary century. poetry. Yes. So like everyone negotiates this in a different way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But like. Um, you know that that idea of of Patrick Swayze's character sort of like longing for more. A lot of this film is about sort of longing for more than like whatever you're 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 supposed to do. Right, and because you know, it's, if we go back to thinking about, they're so proud at the beginning. They're like, "Oh, baby's just graduated, and she's going to go to college, and she's going to join the Peace Corps." And like the opportunities for her are much much broader and wider than they are for the dance people quote unquote, oh, yeah. right yeah. but but yet and but even for her they're still um they're still a circumscribed there's still there's still a, a boundary to what she can and cannot do she can't just run off with johnny right although you know it, it like you think and she this, might though in the you end think of she this might? Movie. yeah no and she it's open you don't know if she does or not and and the 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 romantic part of me wants to believe that they ran off and they lived happily ever <laughs> after. And I'm going to stick with that. Well, right? Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that. But you know, that that's, the, that's what her father, right? He's like, no, you can't be with you. Don't be with these people. Stay away from these people. I don't want you ever to see them again until he realizes what a shit Robbie is the Harvard kid or Yale or wherever he's supposed to be. Um, and he takes the money back from him. It's such a great scene. He gives him an envelope and Robbie admits that it was him. He's like, thank you so much for that trouble with Penny. And, and Jerry Orbach is like, what? And he's like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know. And, and, and <laughs> Orbach takes, he just very quietly just takes the envelope full of cash, we presume back and sticks it back in his blazer and he doesn't well, give it to I, him I, that the <laughs> evolution of the jerry orbach character in this movie is is a, a pretty key one and, yeah and it's done it's the turns are done very subtly like yes. that's one of them where mm-hmm. he's, he literally you know it wants to give money to this college boy who he doesn't realize is the college boy that that Im- impregnated this woman and then abandoned, and then abandoned her, her. Uh, he actually thinks it's Patrick Swayze, and he right. and he goes and apologizes to Patrick yes, Swayze. Yes, he does. He says, "When I'm wrong, I admit when I'm wrong." Right. Um. So there's like growth there, but part of it that's interesting to me is that you know there's this sort of moral the 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 intersection for within Jerry Orbach's heart between like his moral economy, uh, and his sort of uh like practical economy mm-hmm. for his daughter. So in mm-hmm. other words, he wants like Peace Corps, college, etc. Um, but what he really wants is his daughter to like be a good person yes. and his disappointment in her w- when she's getting with these people, he doesn't know why she's not right. She's not really telling him. Right. Her di- his she's disappointment protecting is he, them. he says, I thought you were someone else. Like right. basically, you know, it, his disappointment is, 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 is moral. So that at the end of the film, his realization is like, oh, my daughter's actually not a bad person. Ever, she that, never was. And, right. And that the person, Patrick Swayze, who I thought was a bad person, is, is a good. And, right. And this, like, I totally got it wrong. Right. And like, even, I mean, that's the whole, when he comes and says, you know, no one puts baby in a corner <laughs> and we do the final dance of the movie, you know, before that dance happens, Swayze has to go up to the microphone and give this little monologue yeah. where he says like, look, I met the most wonderful woman. Yeah. You know, he's like, and that she's a good person yeah. and she does the right thing. And he says, I want to be like her. Yeah. Like, and it's like, he doesn't just go up there and be like, I met this hot girl. And we, we fucking dance and <laughs> we love it. It was, it was like, it's really heartfelt. It's and character again. Like you said before, yeah, this right. is about the two of them are about their, 
it's like they fall in love with their actual selves. Like it's not just mm-hmm. lust, although <laughs> lust then is very much. I think the the lust thing is even more amplified because yes. Yes. they've like, and that was a big lesson for me. That was a big fucking lesson for me as a young teenager. That's like. Um, because I was like, I don't know, like any kid, I guess I was sort of dorky and didn't think of myself as, you know, I wasn't like this popular girl and have all fancy clothes or whatever the fuck you worry about when you're 13, 14. And this movie was like, um, she's a powerful girl and she never changes and he falls in love with like her, the essence of her. And then they have this fucking hot ass sex all (laughs) the time. uh And I'm like, (laughs) bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, (laughs) you know, it's really like, it really sticks. It really, um, it really says something about, oh, well, about it all of didn't it. Res- yeah. it uh, Roger Ebert did not, did he not feel it. the same way. But you know what's funny <laughs> is that thinking about this couple um, and, and the, the sort of the way that, that the whole film rests upon the relationship that we're watching, that it has a sexual erotic element, yeah. but also this like character element. You know, I think about... Um, because there's I know there's like a big you know renaissance of James Cameron right now but like if you look at like Titanic like Jack and Rose mm-hmm. a very similar sort of relationship sure right? they're supposed yeah. to be like from different, different classes uh-huh. and right yeah <laughs> everything about it you know yeah. he's gonna teach her some things you know because she's like this, <laughs> but, but she like, teaches him some stuff yes. too and and yeah but I as I recall I mean it's so badly done in oh, Titanic. yeah like it's so like the the whole like draw me like your French girl stuff <laughs> I think that a lot of the stuff that that it is that is done in a sort of subtle and unspoken and artful way um, in Dirty Dancing is done in a really like broad like the, 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 I think Jack and Rose they make a lot of the, the mistakes in Jack and Rose that they avoid making um, it, with Johnny and Baby yeah these are because these are char- it's funny right because these two characters the the Johnny and Baby characters are so and it's just, it's not it's like it's an epically long movie it's a pretty short you know tight story um, but they're so well drawn they're so mm-hmm. real in a way that 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 allows you into this kind of complex psyche and this complex thing that's happening that titanic is so um or thing and and not just titanic but you know a lot of these movies they're so like you said broadly drawn and they're sort of like just um, everything's on the nose on the surface yeah on the nose and on the surface that you're I mean, just like it, it's the fucking billy zane being like <laughs> when they say you know half this ship is gonna die well, not the better half you know like that kind of stuff is just like come on dude. right and that's the robbie character here and we all laugh at him but that robbie character character also fucking gets his ass kicked by yeah, johnny depp by johnny right. depp by Johnny yep. right the Johnny character but he's also like he's not what's important the character doesn't uh, the camera doesn't linger on him the character he doesn't have that much screen time the real like depth of things are they push us to what's actually important here you know and it's and it's the development of these two um you know the 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 growing of these characters, right? Mm-hmm. And he asks her. He's like, "What's your?" He says, "Well, baby, what's your real name?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And she says, "Francis." And he's that's a real grown up name. Yeah. And it's like a signal because it's like after they've had sex for the first time or second time, but it's also like her growing up, not just about having sex, but like she's seen what she never really got to see before because she comes from this very very safe enclave of like wealthy middle class Jewish liberals that have a very specific world and you can go through that world very nicely and very calmly and in a very safe way and never re and, and the thing of like oh I'm going to join the Peace Corps I know that there's uh, poverty and hunger and mm, horror right, but it's far here. but yep. it's far away and I'll get on a plane and I'll go take care of it and then I'll come back and here it's like it's literally at the fucking Kellerman Resort where you're not supposed to see that part. You don't see the back of the house. They they keep you yep. out of the back of the house. Yep. And she goes inside of it. Yeah, that's a great point. That like that that she's like literally, you, you know, as this as this sort of like naive liberal yeah. girl. She's thinking that the problems in the world are international. Yes, you know, it's it's very JFK. You yes. know, it's like oh well, the the problem is actually in Southeast Asia, or the problem is um in 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 Eastern Europe or something like that. Uh, or in or or in Africa, 
rather than understanding that it's like right in front of her face that like the these these problems and when you say problems you mean like literal hunger like and inequality of yeah. a vicious i mean the the fact that the abortion is front and center as the sort of entryway into our understanding of poverty into our understanding of not only poverty but the way these things are uh dealt uh very unequally according to gender and race the mm -hmm. like the the like barbaric elements mm -hmm. of capitalism mm -hmm. um, on the body again yeah, right, right. How i mean it plays it's like literally. you see her i mean there's not a lot of this is a pretty pg-13 oh, movie yeah. despite this sex and and sort of its themes yeah you know that's this abortion like there's blood everywhere it's like you know yeah, it, she's she's it, it's she's clearly it's horrible. it's horrible she's clearly in deep pain like physical pain mm -hmm. and everybody is you know doesn't know what to do for her Swayze talks about um when they have that scene when you know they are rich and they are mean he's talking about literally it's like I'm eating jujubes or candy he says something like that to, to survive and then the next time I've got steaks every day and and it's it's all so fucking precarious and I have to do these things to keep the body literally alive because sometimes the my body is not going to survive and it's I think it's shocking to her because it she didn't imagine it that close yeah and i mean the, it's in her bed i know the body's discourse is all over the place but it really is like in a movie like this it's so on the it's so right. on the surface right. i mean the there's uh, I, I mentioned this scene earlier that at some point the uh, kellerman uh, max kellerman says you know uh uh, as a doctor, you know, you can probably understand what it's like mm. to, to to think you know something about a patient and then take an x-ray and find that they're totally different inside. Well, that's exactly what it's like when you find out that one of your employees is a thief. <laughs> and I thought, holy shit, like that's some <laughs> fucked up like eugenic sort yeah. of idea like one of, and, and he's talking about johnny like right. he thinks that patrick at the end of the film patrick swayze is sort of like mistakenly you know uh, uh assumed to be the person who's stealing these wallets it ends up being this other couple it's kind of a side piece in the movie it's uh, vivian story. pressman's revenge right. for, for reject the, that dance lesson that her husband tried to buy yes that's her revenge because she sees him with baby in the morning and that's she right and she yeah, accused that's her, you know no, what? it's total vengeance she's she's a total because he you You've seen this movie more than me, yeah. so you've connected that. I, you know, I, I, yeah. in those scenes, I'm always like, oh, that girl is seeing, that woman is Oof. seeing uh, Baby and uh, and Johnny together, but I think she's just like jealous or pissed. But yeah, yeah no, she actually she got actually zets her, she <laughs> attempts to get revenge because she accuses him of stealing and it and she gets her revenge even though he's exonerated of the stealing he still is fired because he's been with baby and that's forbidden and we know that from that opening scene that you talked about when max is telling the waiters and telling them what you're all allowed to do and not to do with which women um yeah he's that's, violated the right uh, the rules. exactly Exactly. Because there was no exchange of money. It would have been okay to be with Vivian because Vivian's husband paid for her, but nobody paid for baby to be with Johnny. So Johnny's not allowed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, pure fucking exchange of like currency here. Yeah. They've violated that. Yeah, they've no, totally. they've not done that. I mean, that. so much of this movie is about exchange and about, yeah, money, uh, money, class, uh, and 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 the the sort of things that the the human bodies can do, but right. specifically, and that's why I brought up Jack and Rose. That it's not just Baby and Johnny that that there is this sort of eroticism across class lines. I mean, the whole thing of like the, Vivian, you know, yeah, it, these rich women want. To, to touch these yes. four guys. Yep, because they're, you know they're I mean? because they're forbidden. They're hot and they're and young that's Kate and they're Winslet sexy. Wants to yes. touch uh, um, Leo. Yeah, Leo yeah. because he's uh, a scumbag from the other side. Yeah, he's you know? this poor. I mean, kid. Zizek has this whole great bit in like uh, *Pervert's Guide to Cinema* where he says like, you know. I won't do the, the Zizek accent, but like <laughs> Titanic is literally, you know, about like the vampiric relationship that like the elites have to lower classes in which they're sort of like, she goes down and like learns the Irish jig. Like, right. Dancing, right. Right. Dancing, right? Dancing again. Yes. Let's talk about that really quickly yeah. because I know we're running out of time, but like I, I, this is something that I was thinking about earlier that I had to bring up to you, Claudia, because I think, you know, these movies better than I do. But I mean, we mentioned Saturday Night Fever. Right. There's a dancing movie. Footloose, you watched recently. I just watched right? it recently. Yes, um, yes. It, it, there's something like dancing seems like a constant theme in films about class and about sort of like the relationship between um, 
be, not only class but race too. Yeah, the, you know, yeah, and, and all that intersectionality <laughs> is sort of played out in these dances. Yeah, and like Saturday Night Fever, Footloose, Dirty Dancing. I mean, there's a million. I've Fame, mentioned the Lombada flash dance. Does anyone remember the Lombada? They oh. actually did a forbidden dance movie of, of the Lombada, <laughs> 1990. I have no idea. Someone else, someone. I think another podcast might want to take that uh, the Lombada uh, film on because I don't want to watch that it. One. <laughs> but what? Yeah, what's going on with that? Well, I you're mean, a big, you're into dance. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is I saw this when I was at the peak of being in dancing school, thought I might become a dancer. Part of me still regrets I never did become a Arthur dancer. Murray. Yeah, <laughs> part of me still is like, fuck, you know. Yeah. Um, there's, it's about, I mean, I think it's again this thing of body. I mean, and it's, it, you got to be careful because it's the kind of romance this thing that says that the black bodies and the brown bodies mm-hmm. are freer and sexier and they dance better mm-hmm. right yeah um and so there's yeah there's that Those african rhythm i mean <laughs> they, it, this stuff comes up in yeah, the movie i mean they the, literally talk about the pachanga and yes, a, like, the, yes. the, the mamba and like they're right and uh uh patrick swayze wants to he's wants to do some like cuban fusion the, okay so the scene where they in his cabin when they the first time they have sex you can see his record crate and the first record is perez prado and uh perez prado was a cuban Cuban band leader who made the mumble very famous, right? right? It's literally like he's steeped in it. So you have like, it's playing on that, but then it's also this idea, right? That it, the, you know, if you, uh, the merengue, well, the, 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 the Jewish families doing the foxtrots and the merengues and they're all like stumbling around and they're, and it's not about their Jewishness, <laughs> but it's about their, um, uptightness yeah. and their stiffness. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it has to do with their values and their belief systems. And it's uh, the, if you want to show like expressiveness of the body without actually showing sex, dance is one way you do it because you can't, you're not, you can't be a good dancer. You can't dance well if you're not allowed, if you're not, don't allow yourself to be vulnerable. Mm. If you don't allow yourself to, um, let go of your mind a little bit in some ways like it doesn't it doesn't work and so there's this real contrast of like the body that is attempting the mind that is holding onto the body so tightly in order to be this good thing right whereas if you you know this question is like she's still a good person even though she's totally allowed her body to be this kind of you have Dangerous to be relaxed thing. and open to to dance well. This is why right. people drink and dance. Right, honestly, right, right, because it takes out your inhibitions. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because you, know, you talk about drink in for such a sexy movie. There's no, no, the no dr- drugs they, and alcohol. They, in this movie, no, not much. you see them drinking. They they've got beers and a, a little bit in the beginning where they're um when when they're in the like the, all the, everybody's dancing and she first comes upon them. But it's like the drinking thing is like it's a not focus movie. That's what I mean. Like yeah. this movie has, is economical and focused in what it wants to say and do. It doesn't want to be about like everything. And if they had drinking, right. if they had drugs here, they I mean you could add this world. It's it's the early sixties. This world is very rich yeah. with a lot of themes you could throw in. But it seems like what they really wanted to concentrate on uh, uh, is like the, specifically, and I think that, you know, part of this is because the writer of the film, Eleanor, uh, also named after a, uh, a you know, a New Deal, yeah. New Deal era political figure, uh, <laughs> because she says I'm named after Frances Perkins, who's the first uh, first woman in the, in in the Congress, cabinet, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, um, in, a, in a presidential cabinet. Uh, she's the secretary, first secretary of labor. But either way, you know, <laughs> liberals all the way down. Um, right. But the writer of this film, you know, you feel like this is her experience. Like this is an right. autobiographical film. And I think part of, it the, literally is. Part of the yeah. reason why this is such a successful film is because this woman, uh, Eleanor Bergstein, who wrote this film, she, um, she, she, this was in Hollywood for a long time. It was in like development hell. They said no one wanted to make this movie, but it was, everyone recognized it as a powerful script. They were, just couldn't attach certain stars to it. Right, you know? right. And they had trouble getting like, with the music as well because people yep. didn't want to like put their names to it. It's a weirdly kind of unique just like the outsiders it's like a hollywood production but almost like an independent film like there's nothing quite like it these right. the, the 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 team that put this together the choreographers the director the writers they didn't really do much else besides dirty dancing like right. dirty dancing was their labor of love right and i feel like that's part of why this film is so good is because they really especially eleanor bergstein really whittled the story down had lots of time over the years right. <laughs> to edit it down to like its essence it's not it wouldn't make sense if we had like lots of drugs and alcohol and other things it was like right this isn't far as gump this no, isn't everything thank you. yeah right <laughs> this is and it's not so like woke and telling you like no. this is a women's issue film or anything it's mainly 
a fucking really entertaining story. Oh my god, like, yes, with some of the into. best music and dancing you're gonna see on film, and you are immediately from that opening shot. It's the it's the Ronettes, right? It's yeah. that Phil Spector. Yes. And you're like, ah, and it's this black and white, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and then there you are, and you're immediately just like you're in it. Yeah. A lot of good fellas music in this. Yeah, in yeah, fact, a lot and, of and, and, and even uh Irishman, the should up do be do that one um in the still of the night is so in there. much i so mean much. a million songs but let's say something about the last scene song because i think you know <laughs> that that's the uh, i've had the time of my life which <laughs> right. is this duet song which was everywhere i don't know if this song is still everywhere but this song was everywhere yep. when i was growing up yep. late 80s 90s i mean it was. They used it at like graduations, weddings. I think they use it at funerals. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why not? I mean, wouldn't it be great to have a gravestone that said, "I've had the time yeah, of my life." No like, shit, right? That, uh, then you did pretty well. Uh, what, what more could you ask for? But what's weird about it though is that you know, for a soundtrack that's all you know, mu- music that's from the era. It's all '60s stuff. Mm-hmm. They actually made an '80s song. Yeah. It's, it's kind of weird because yeah. you're like, wait a second. This doesn't work like logically because <laughs> no. all of a sudden like this is it, there's 80 synthesizer music and this dance they do at the end which is the most prolonged dance sequence it's almost a fantasy because the 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 entertainers that are Johnny's friends they all of a sudden start doing the choreographed line dance <laughs> behind him and everything. And it's so, I mean, it's such an incredible, like such, I mean, it's such a great climax to this movie. This movie, I think, really is the best that Hollywood can do in a lot of ways. Small movies that have like social yeah. and, you know, social and political issues that are woven in them, but not like, they're you know, that's the whole point. Smacking you in the face. Yeah. But they're there, but, and, and you know. There, it makes it even richer. Of course. And think I'm thinking about it from the perspective of having seen it as a young teenager and remembering every single bit of it mm-hmm. from for years and years and years and years on end. It never disappeared. Sometimes, I mean, years go by between the times I see it sometimes. And I could s- still recite the whole fucking thing by heart to you because all of that stuff um, stays. But yeah, there's another song too, the one that Patrick Swayze sings. She's, She's like, like the, the wind. wind. Yes. And there's and even as a, as a kid, I was like, these, Those what the fuck? Those are great these? songs, man. <laughs> Dude, the She's Like the Wind, I, you know what's funny? I remember my brother in English It was like, but why school, are they here? <laughs> in, English, in, in English English class, we had he had to write a an essay about a song and he wrote uh, an essay about She's Like the Wind <laughs> and, he, and he had the lyrics and everything because um, we had the tape, I right, think. And yeah. I think maybe the tape had the Prob- lyrics. Yeah, probably. But God, that's... A, that, you know, I I, I want to know like who wrote that song because that's such a. It's, I think Swayze might have. Dude, it's. I think I it's mean, actually might be his song. It's don't... a well. It's a well produced little. That's a banger. Yeah. That one. I love. I love. She's like the wind. But the, uh, the, the I've had the time of my life song. It's weird, right? Because it's 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 not a 60s song no not at all that way and yet it works somehow it's supposed to I read somewhere some quote I think it's by the uh, Jennifer Warnes right that she says that the two of them are like their voices are supposed to kind of be the two of them Johnny and Baby like later like it's a projection in a sense you can read it that way I was thinking as a projection and that their voices are supposed to sort of match that it's like later and and it's um, (laughs) so it really you're right it really does become like almost like a fantasy at the end, but that's part of what makes it so gratifying and satisfying yes. that it's like she finally gets the lift uh-huh. and they do the dance. And there's also precedent for the dance because he has said to Ben Kellerman earlier, I've been working with these kid with the kids on this routine that's kind of like this <laughs> Cuban thing, right? So you're like, oh, in the logic of the film, he's actually been teaching them this and they all just bust out and it's like right. okay. this fantastic dance scene. And, and no, it's totally unrealistic and it's totally fucking fantastic. But you, uh- I was just stoned enough while I was watching this last night <laughs> to be like, you hear the future because like, <laughs> I'm it, you know what right. I mean? You were because right. You, they're, yes. they're in 1963, <laughs> but they're hearing 1987 synthesizers yes. Yes. and drum machines and voices. You're right. And it brings you back into the moment that you're actually, because if you're watching it in 1987, it brings you from the sixties back to your present yeah. and it makes it, there you are. And that's the end credits. That's the end and credits, like, like, yeah. And the time machine of the film drops you back off yeah. in the 80s. And they lived God. happily. See, I was right. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I assume they did. Yeah, um, you have to assume they, they did. They are uh, apparently making some sort of reboot sequel with Jennifer Grey. It I don't want to know about it. like a bad idea uh, because this film is is just a little, a little gem of the 80s. I, I say that, but this... 
this movie made like two hundred and fifty oh, million dollars. Massive. No one expected this to be a huge hit, and I think that it was a huge hit because of all the elements we have identified here. Which, whether people admit that or not, this film was not. It's not just a, a dirty dance thing. It's a dumb title. Like it's not a. <laughs> it, it, it does that doesn't capture what this film is really about. Right. Like th- this film resonated with people. If you made a just dumb movie about hot people dancing, how many movies have we seen that? And they did after right. they made Dirty Dancing 2, Havana Nights or whatever the fuck that one was called. Were and any of them in it? No, no, no. I know it might have been the same choreographer, but none of them were in it. At least I don't think so. Swayze certainly wasn't in it. I don't think she was in it either. I, I didn't see it. And I was like, you know, there was no bigger fan of Dirty Dancing than I was. And I was like, mm, I'm going to skip that. And I continued to skip it. And we'll, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, because who wants to see that? No, right. Yeah. That's the thing. Is like all the dance movies you mentioned, Saturday Night Fever before, yep. and I was thinking about Flashdance or Footloose or Fame. Oh, Flashdance, yeah, Fame. yeah, they're all that. It's these, all F. yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that they all. Those are the because they made a million dance movies, but the ones that stick out, they all have something more right they're like no there's something about the people in them that elevates the just like oh i'm just watching like softcore porn dancing which right, you know yeah. is fine well but, i mean uh, musicals and you know broadway musical dance movies were like oh, as massive. big as westerns yes, at some point in yes, hollywood history yes. like, i mean some of the best some of the most amazing like choreography and camera work that's ever been done were those Hollywood dance yeah, movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the old ones. Yeah. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're talking about these dance movies that sort of like, it's funny because those like the post Hollywood, post golden age of Hollywood, post, yes. mm-hmm. post uh, new Hollywood, you know, 70s, 70s right. coming in and, and, and making everything real dirty and gritty. And, and all of a sudden we have these sort of like social issue dancing yeah. movies. Yeah. I, it's, it's, uh, we should return to this theme Yeah, because you know what I'm thinking about now? My two favorite dance movies uh, and I, I don't know if they even qualify as dance movies. Well, first of all, all that jazz, uh, you know, right? That's uh, um, the Roy Scheider, definitely um, a dance movie. Bo- yeah, Bob Fosse, that's definitely a dance movie. But the other one is Black Swan, which is an Aronofsky oh, yeah. movie. <laughs> um, I love that movie, and I feel like it's doing a lot. We have to think with obviously dancing bodies, yeah, uh, gender, uh, psychosis, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, and totally. all that jazz. I mean, is about a guy like literally fucking disintegrating and dying <laughs> while he's making this musical. I mean, this shit is, I, I feel like um, just this conversation about Dirty Dancing, we've stumbled upon this idea, uh, but one that we both ta- talked about now, I realize, a lot over yeah. time, which is sort of like the dancing movie yeah. uh, as, as a sort of like um, evolving trope and kind of a rich place. Now I want to now I want to go back and watch all those others. Although you <laughs> said Footloose was kind of disappointing. Footloose, well, Footloose is, is uh, it's, it's hilarious. It does not have the depth of this. Uh, Kevin Bacon ain't Patrick Swayze. Oh, God. Sorry, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin Bacon. Well, Lo- Kevin Bacon occupies the, a different place, to be fair. But the thing is that I, I loved him in it, but it's it seemed like it was weird to make it about dance. The dance, uh, the dance part of Footloose actually seems almost tacked on and it doesn't work don't they do a class story in footloose oh yeah 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 yeah. no it is it's a class of the outsider his family (laughs) comes in and and it has the best my favorite um mike not michael penn yeah michael penn michael penn chris penn chris penn chris penn thank you there we go chris penn sorry (laughs) best favorite performance of his ever where he yeah where he transforms from like the sort of like uh almost like a bully into this awkward can't dance until the fucking best hottest cutest dancer you've ever seen he's better than kevin bacon and he should have been the star i was gonna i'll end on that (laughs) (laughs) you know i was the whole time you were there i was like michael penn there is a michael penn he's the guy i mean he's one of the penn brothers there's chris penn reservoir dogs there's sean penn everyone Um, knows Right. Uh, and and Michael Penn, I think, is the guy that works with uh, PTA um, in, in music. I think. Oh, my, yeah. okay. So there. Sorry, it came from someplace. Um, well, thanks anyway. for talking to me about <laughs> Dirty Dancing, Claudia. I, I would like to say that um, I've had the time of my life. Oh, <laughs> I'm leaving. Um, but thanks, and we'll we'll catch up with you soon. <laughs> Okay, I think that's going to do it for Dirty Dancing. I want to thank my guest, Claudia Moreno Parsons. We always have a fun time talking about movies, and I hope you enjoy our conversations. We've got lots more on our Patreon. If you have the ability and desire to support our show, please do so at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Uh, And come by on Thursdays. We are live every Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time on our YouTube channel, uh, often with Justin Rogers Cooper and other guests talking about whatever the fuck is going on because Jesus Lord, it's going to be a weird year. 
uh, as it always is. Um, thanks so much. I appreciate everyone supporting the show, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, see ya.